Jackson Ward, Virginia, 1933. Eight-year-old Daisy walks hand-in-hand with her mother. They're shopping for Easter Sunday clothes. But as they board a bus, she's confused as to why they can't sit in the empty seats up front. Later, walking past a restaurant, she doesn't know why the white people get to sit inside while the black people are out in the beating sun. And finally, while in the clothing store, Daisy reaches for a hat to try on just to have it snatched away by a white lady sales clerk. She's not allowed to touch, the store clerk shouts. Daisy's mother's eyes turn cold. Well, if she can't touch, then we aren't buying. And without hesitation, Daisy's mother grabs her hand and they leave the store. Daisy received her first taste of racism that day. And more than 20 years later, she'd get an even bigger dose when her family moved to a segregated white neighborhood. Like many suburban areas, this one had been paid for through the discriminatory practices of redlining, a systematically racist banking policy that would financially hurt African-American families for generations to come. This episode is brought to you by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. We know there can be lots of barriers that keep you and your family from getting to a medical clinic, but they're here to help. And children up to age 21 may even qualify for free checkups. Learn more at u21checkups.com. Redlining is defined as the withholding of services, financial and otherwise, based on race or ethnicity. It's also sometimes been described as a giant racist octopus spreading its tentacles throughout the black community an apt comparison given the level of damage it's caused. The foundation for redlining was laid out before the abolishment of slavery, as freed blacks found themselves handicapped by laws keeping them from benefiting from government programs. One of the first such laws was the Homestead Act of 1862, which excluded blacks and non-whites from government housing initiatives. This, along with the acceptability of racism and the threat of violence if they were caught somewhere white supremacists thought they shouldn't be, kept them locked down in the racially designated parts of their respective cities. Then, in 1932, as the country struggled amidst the Great Depression, the government enacted the Federal Home Loan Bank Act, which authorized the Homeowners Loan Corporation to draw up maps and apply a coding system to designate which areas should receive loans. Some neighborhoods would be labeled A for affluent, while others would be marked D for declining. And getting declined is exactly what would happen when black people from those neighborhoods would apply for home loans. And the maps were specific about the racial makeup of the neighborhoods within every U.S. city, with the color red being used for black and other minority populated areas. Anyone in a red-lined neighborhood would automatically be considered a risky investment, even if their income and credit worthiness was equal to or more than that of a white person in a green or a blue zone. Then the wealth gap was born. In 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in an effort to pull a tanked U.S. economy out of the Great Depression, signed off on the New Deal. It was a multi-agency initiative that was supposed to provide relief for millions of unemployed and the American agricultural industry. It was meant to reinvigorate the American middle class, and for some, it succeeded. Many previously poverty-stricken white families were able to buy homes, build suburban communities, and surround themselves with beauty and prosperity. Unfortunately, however, with the color coding system in place, the New Deal miserably failed the African American community. While the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration would back $120 billion in loans between 1934 and 1962, 98% of that money would go to white families and less than 2% of it to blacks and other minorities. And being able to buy and build homes meant that those white families were able to accumulate wealth that would be used to send their kids to college and pass down a legacy of wealth and property ownership. Without access to this generous helping hand, minority families and communities would struggle in ways that were unheard of by their white counterparts. And as if another barrier to progress was needed, many of these flourishing white suburban neighborhoods, like the infamous Levittown, Pennsylvania, would enact covenants that forbid the sale of any neighborhood property to blacks. Even if a black person did get a homeowner's loan, it would typically be for a property in their redlined neighborhood which meant the home would be undervalued and the mortgage attached to a higher interest rate. Insurance was also higher, ultimately decreasing the home's estimated investment worth, or equity, making it harder to maintain and keep out of foreclosure. But leaving people incapable of homeownership and business loans is only one tentacle of this problem. This is a racist octopus, remember. As any neighborhood becomes wealthier, so does its surroundings, thanks at least in part to the influx of cash generated from property taxes. In a neighborhood with good tax revenue, local hospitals have access to the latest in medical advancements, meaning residents there get to live longer, healthier lives. 
Supermarkets are more conveniently located, well-stocked, and filled with fresh quality produce. Small businesses thrive, providing an overall source of neighborhood pride. And most important of all, schools are better funded and located, ultimately setting up those kids for multiple chances to succeed in life. Meanwhile, in the redlined areas, underfunded hospitals are overrun, as heart disease, cancer, asthma, and diabetes ravage a stressed-out community at much higher rates. There's limited access to affordable food with any nutritional value, as many of these supermarket chains seem to have instituted their own version of redlining. And in turn, this lack of service in low-income areas has created what the Department of Agriculture calls food deserts all across the country. And as the years melt into decades, the adults pass this struggle on to their children, who not only have to endure the usual trappings of adolescence, but often do so in a disillusioning and dangerous environment. One of our country's more glaring disparities can be found in the state of Michigan, where the schools in Detroit are literally falling apart around the students' heads, while only a few miles away, Gross Point South High School has marble floors, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and other non-crumbling amenities. Of course, it makes sense. If you consider that as the schools rise in worth, so do the neighboring homes and vice versa. Redlining was then made illegal by the Fair Housing Act of 1962. However, the property values were never reconfigured, so the properties in urban neighborhoods are still grossly undervalued. Even worse, banks have been caught redlining as recently as 2015, with little to no consequences. This lack of accountability led to reverse redlining in the form of predatory lending, providing loans with conditions the banks know the borrowers will not be able to meet that targeted black families and contributed mightily to the economic collapse of 2008. And all over the country, redlined areas are also the focal point of intense police scrutiny, prompting increased and unnecessary interaction with law enforcement based on where someone may or may not live. Despite the fact that illegal drug use is statistically the same among all races, black people are three times more likely to be arrested or at least stopped by the police. For a quick illustration of this, literally only one of the four people who worked on this episode has ever been stopped and frisked. And if your guess was SVP, well, that just means you've been listening. Now, this begs the question, has anyone ever tried to fight redlining? The answer is yes. Affluent blacks all over the country either protested or created workarounds, sometimes by amassing wealth and buying properties outright. Of course, in those cases, the KKK would show up and burn a cross in front of said property, like they did to black orchestra leader George Morrison, who would endure three separate cross burnings when he ventured too far from Denver's now historic Five Points neighborhood. And then there was Daisy Myers, who we referenced at the beginning of this episode. Regarded as the Rosa Parks of the North, she with her husband William and their three children bravely stood their ground in 1957 in the all-white neighborhood of Levittown, Pennsylvania, enduring months of racist harassment until the local authorities finally stepped in. As for modern efforts, organizations like the Greenlining Institute based in Oakland, California, are pushing for the kind of reforms previously redlined neighborhoods could benefit from. And you can find out more info on them and how you can help in the description below. The problem is, redlining has already done tremendous damage to those families and communities who found themselves shunned and their dreams deferred. And even when caught red-handed redlining, the banking industry seldom suffers any consequences outside of bad press. This is why a wealth gap exists between whites and American minorities that may never be closed. In fact, it's estimated that even if racism were to somehow magically go away today, it would take 200 years for us to see anything that resembles real economic equality. So if you ever find yourself looking down on someone because of where they live or where they come from, you should rethink that. Because it turns out that while some of us got a helping hand, many others received nothing but a slap in the face. Once again, thanks so much to Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota for sponsoring this episode. As we just discussed, we know that there can be lots of barriers that keep you from getting to a health clinic, but that's where Child and Teen Checkups Program can help. They provide resources for low-income families to take charge of their own health, including things like transportation assistance and interpreters, not to mention dental health is included in their programs. But best of all, kids may even qualify for free annual checkups. You can get started today and learn more at u21checkups.com. That's the letter U, 21, checkups.com. This show wouldn't be possible without legendary patrons like Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One.